Um, I would like to thank you. <laughs> so, um, hello and welcome to our online present presentation of the report, which is dedicated to a very important topic of the female face of Donbass hostages. And today we're going to present the report uh, which was prepared by the Media Initiative for Human Rights, the organization that I represent. And this report was prepared mostly by my colleague, Tatiana Katrychenko. She's going to have the floor in several minutes. And uh, Katarina Busel, uh, she is with us as well, our expert. Uh, she also participated in the preparations of this report. And uh, this report, as well as the whole project dedicated to the issue of female face of Don Donbass hostages, was supported by the Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany in Kyiv. And uh, here I would like to immediately say that we are privileged and delighted uh, to host today two ambassadors. Uh, these are ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany to Ukraine, Ms. Anka Feldhusen. And thank you so much for joining us and for the, supporting this topic and this project. But also we are uh, privileged to, to host Ambassador John Herbst, who represents the Atlantic Council. He is a senior director uh, of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. He is a former ambassador to Ukraine. And recently we met in Washington, D.C. And thank you so much, Ambassador, for joining us uh, today as well. And uh, before I will give the floor to ambassadors for the welcoming words to our today's meeting, I would like just to say a few words that uh, it seems to us that the topic of illegal detainees in Donbass and the female face, which was not previously researched and discussed within the Ukrainian society is important also um, uh, given this uh, troops uh, build up of the Russian troops near Ukrainian uh, border that we all discuss now uh, on the both sides of the Atlantics. And also this um, uh, situation raises the issue of course of humanitarian um, um, problems and possible consequences of the further escalation for those people who are detained in the occupied territories and they that they ca cannot even uh, take care of themselves, of course, in this situation. And also, I would like to note that recently, uh, President Zelensky announced uh, possible negotiations uh, uh, over the uh, release of hostages that might happen, uh, we also hope so, uh, before or after the uh, Christmas. But it, it's not, of course, the, was the announcement, it was rather hope that was expressed uh, by the Ukrainian government that something might happen, uh, but we're not sure still. Uh, so, and as of now, uh, we have uh, 300 people, just as a reminder, at least 300 people detained uh, in the in Donbass, uh, non-government controlled areas, and 30 of them, at least 30 of them, are women. Uh, and it's one of the key issues for us um, uh, as, as, as a human rights NGO that is working with this issue. And now, without the further delay, I would like to give the floor to Ambassador Feldhusen for the welcoming words uh, and then to Ambassador Herbst. And after that, I will introduce uh, the key speakers and will uh, give them the floor. Uh, Miss Ambassador, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Tomak, Ms. Katrishenko, Ms. Busser. Dear Ambassador Herbst, I understand uh, my good friend Oksana has not joined us. So. But nevertheless, I mean, just back from Kharkiv an hour ago, I'm, I'm really glad um, to be joining uh, the Media Initiative for Human Rights uh, today um, for the international presentation of your report on the female faces of the Donbass hostages. Um, I have already had the chance to read part of it, and I, I must say I am actually proud that the German Embassy has been supporting the production uh, of this report. I think it will be very useful in highlighting the plight and the special needs, not only of female prisoners in Oslo, but also of their families. The report underlines the simple, yet sometimes overlooked fact that women face completely different challenges than men, especially in a context like imprisonment and war. This is the fundamental insight of women peace and uh, of the women peace and security agenda. Um, there are different numbers on, uh, on how many women have been on how many women have been in prison in Oslo since the outbreak of the conflict, and your report brilliantly explains why the true number can be expected to be much higher. 
um, some fear that informing Ukrainian authorities might endanger their loved ones uh, and others are quickly released and stay under the radar after their detention. Um, however, it is safe to say, I think that there are too many for any Ukrainian authority, you know, that there are too many for any Ukrainian authority to remain indifferent to their special needs and that of their families. And when I spoke with you last time, you gave me the opportunity to exchange personally with some of the affected women um, featured in this report. Um, they impressed me not only with their stories, but uh, uh, also with their perseverance to fight for the uh, for the rel their relatives, their friends, and for themselves. Back then, I actually promised uh, to take up the issue with the Ukrainian and international counterparts. Um, and I'm happy to tell you that I had conversations with the Ombudswoman for Human Rights, the new Minister for Reintegration, and with the coordinator of the Humanitarian Working Group in the TCG. I hope this will continue to contribute to, to raising awareness um, for the issue. And I also welcome the fact that, uh, welcome that the Ukrainian side has made a renewed attempt to agree on terms of release of some political prisoners in the TCG, among them also several women and some of uh, those whom we spoke about. I hope that the personal commitment of President Zelensky can help break the deadlock that we had to witness in this field since April 2020. There's a humanitarian imperative for both sides, I think, to make progress. Every day that political prisoners can't spend in detention is a day worth working for. And your report on top documents the horrible conditions that inmates, inmates have to face in Oslo. Their basic human and procedural rights are grossly violated. Some cannot even inform their relatives about their imprisonment. And I think uh, not knowing is, is perhaps the worst. The so-called lawyers often cooperate with the armed formations. Their health often deteriorates in prison. The conditions in the cells are deplorable. And when they are released, the long-term effects of imprisonment continue to weigh on them and their families psychologically, physically, and very often also economically. Um, in light of all this, Ukraine has all the means to contrast sharply from the blatant disregard for human rights that we see on the other side of the contact line. Ukraine, I think, must wholeheartedly provide for its imprisoned citizens and their families. And I do welcome the president's draft law on social and legal protection of political prisoners and their families, which he registered in the RADA in September. The most important aspect in my view is that families of political prisoners will receive state support and that their kids' education will be financed from the state budget. I hope the draft will be adopted soon. And we will certainly raise it when we can with the, with the MPs in the RADA. While improving Ukrainian authorities' responses to the need of female, needs of female prisoners and their families must not stop with the adoption of this law, um, I am sure your report can help drive it. Again, thank you for having me today and for your important work. And I'm looking forward to learning more about it uh, and to continue working with you even after this project that we really proudly funded uh, has ended. We definitely remain on your side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador, and thank you for your kind words, uh, for your support in particular uh, regarding the legislation, which is really very important. And um, for, unfortunately, despite the fact that this uh, legislation, draft law, was prioritized by the president, it still was not voted by the parliament. Hopefully, it will happen uh, even before New Year. And now I would like to give the floor to Ambassador Herbst uh, to provide us with probably the US perspective on uh, the problem of of uh, civilians, uh, civilian victims of the conflict, but also uh, on the prism about the current situation with uh, uh, the buildup of the Russian troops before, uh, near the Ukrainian borders. All right. I'd first like to thank the German ambassador, the German embassy for sponsoring this project, because it is a wonderful project. And Maria, we're delighted to host you in Washington, you and your team, to go over this project, which is why I'm with you today. Uh, look. Um, what you've done with this is highlight the, the human face, uh, the female face of suffering in Donbass as a result of Moscow's aggression. And that's very important to put on the public record so that people understand precisely what's been going on there for almost eight years. Uh, regarding, the, regarding the current crisis, uh, there's no question Moscow has assembled 
up to 100,000, maybe up and with plans to more than 100,000 troops on your borders in various places. And they are threatening a major conventional operation in Ukraine. Um, my personal view is this is bluff. He will not strike, Putin will not strike. Because in fact, uh, the Biden administration has done a very good job laying out to Mr. Putin the, da the damage that he would do to his own country if he strikes. Um, there's been excellent coordination with Germany, with France, with Britain, with the EU more broadly, and of course with Ukraine, as we put together a package of, of truly damaging sanctions if Putin sends those troops across the border. Um, Biden has also made clear, again, in conjunction with our allies, that NATO will put additional forces in the Eastern NATO nations if Moscow goes into Ukraine with conventional forces in large numbers. And finally, there'll be serious American military support for Ukraine, uh, military assistance, if that happens. Um, so I believe that these measures have, are helping to persuade Mr. Putin simply to bluff. But bluff, I suspect this period of tension will last for six, eight, 10 weeks. Um, and we cannot rule out the possibility that he in fact will strike. I would just add, even though I don't believe Putin is going in, if he does decide to go in, do not rule out him doing that at the end of December when everybody is celebrating Christmas and New Year's. But I do not think that will happen. And again, thank you for your work. It is wonderful, it's important. And to the extent that we can help amplify your project, um, we are happy to do it. And again, thank you, uh, Madam Ambassador, for your support for this worthy, worthy project. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. And as you mentioned uh, the issue of sanctions, which is very important to for us, I would like to also underline that we have issued the submission for imposing sanctions against those people who are related to the Isolatia prison camp, where, for instance, Stanislav Asiev was held for, for a long, long time. And uh, we really hope that the US, as well as the EU, will impose uh, these sanctions uh, at least sooner or later. And now uh, let me uh, uh, give the floor to our key speakers. Uh, I would like to uh, introduce them. But before that, uh, for those of you who do not speak Ukrainian, as most of them are going to speak Ukrainian, I would like to invite you to press the interpretation button in the bottom of your screen and choose the English interpretation. Um, so. And now let me introduce our speakers. So we have Tatiana Katrichenko that I've already uh, introduced a little bit. It's my colleague. Uh, Tatiana is a journalist actually, who has been working with the issue of hostages in Donbass for, for years since at least 2015. And at some point we met and we decided to cooperate as Tatiana was uh, no more uh, a pure journalist uh, in this topic because she uh, was helping and assisting to relatives try to um, help and support them. So, and she is the main author of the report. Um, so Tatiana is with us and she will uh, introduce the report. Um, uh, it's very important that today we have uh, a relative of one of the uh, detainees, a female, a female detainees, uh, Lyudmila Husseinova. And her story is really striking because she is a volunteer. She helped two children uh, in the um, uh, those children who are living in orphanages near the uh, borderline between Ukraine and uh, temporarily occupied territories. And that's why she was captured. Um, and she's staying for, for years in the, in the illegal detention. And we have Tatiana Halant, uh, her uh, relative, who will uh, introduce uh, the story of, of this uh, car courageous uh, woman. And uh, last but not least, uh, Katarina Busol is with us. She is a lawyer specializing in armed conflict and gender issues. And she, as I've uh, mentioned previously, draft, uh, helped us to draft uh, the report in particular in terms, of, in terms of the recommendations that are really comprehensive. And for those of you who had not uh, have not um, had not chance to uh, go uh, through them, I would recommend to do that because they're really very substantial and comprehensive. So without further delay, uh, Tatiana Katrichenko, the floor is yours. Uh, Tatiana, Я попрошу говорити повільніше, щоб з перекладом встигали. Тетяна, please speak slowly to make sure our interpreters are catching up. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank you, 
uh, for your interest uh, in this uh, topic. Uh, during the afternoon of the report, on more than one occasion, I heard uh, uh, from women their stories about what uh, detentions on the uncontrolled territories were like, and uh, the attention to the topic helps them to survive this experience and survive this trauma. And those who initially seemed very close, those that we were writing about in our report, they would open up later, they would speak about their experience, and what is also important, the experiences of uh, their relatives. This report is a result of more than one year of work. We have been working on it since March uh, 2021, uh, but we've been exploring the topic, the media initiative for human Rights has been exploring the topic for several years. And we realized that the issue of illegal detentions on the non-government controlled territories requires uh, much coverage. And there's a reason for that. These territories are um, uh, closed. In occupied Crimea, uh, sooner or later, a lawyer can come to the detainees or mass media uh, or civic journalists that they refer to, they can come to detainees. Um, in Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast, people simply disappear. It, these are the cases when the person simply doesn't make it to work or doesn't make it back home one day. And then the family spend months or years looking for these people. They try to find a way they're being held, trying to give something to those people. And there's no way knowing whether uh, the medications or food makes it there. And not to mention about the visits. The visits are prohibited. And there's no information about the health of those detainees, not to mention the reasons for detention and the prospects of release and I would like to emphasize that uh, Ukraine and the entire world needs know, to know about the problem. They need to know that in the very center of Europe, unknown people are kidnapping and torturing people. We need to speak about that. Uh, to make this topic uh, relevant, we decided to implement the project um, female face of Donbass hostages. And we wanted uh, uh, to speak about the issue of hostages, uh, describing the stories of a female detainees. We drafted uh, uh, questionnaires. We talked with the hostages that were released. And uh, the relatives of the hostages uh, uh, it's through their efforts these women were released uh, and uh, the necessary evidence was not found by those who were detaining the women. So that is one of the reasons why they were released. We talked to the families of the hostages, uh, uh, the families of the women that are held in detention. Uh, these are not only women, but men as well. We talked to their wives, to their mothers, children. And uh, we see that those women whose husbands or fathers are taken away, they are hostages to circumstances. But Ukraine, 
the public and mass media know even less about them than the hostages, than about hostages in ord law. And then refer to themselves as hostages to circumstances because there's uh, nothing they can change. There's nothing they can do to have their close people released. They don't have access to high quality legal aid. The hostages do not have access to justice. Instead, they uh, get uh, uh, threats. There are searches conducted at their places of residence. There are threats that their children will be taken away, threats that uh, something bad is going to happen to their parents or children. And the families, the relatives are forced to flee the occupied territories because they know that tomorrow someone might uh, come after them and they might be detained uh, and not necessarily for a long time, but at the least they might be detained for 30 days, the so-called administrative arrest. So they um, run away, they look for places to stay close to the contact line. Others go to Kyiv because there are more job opportunities to Kyiv, which is very important for them because um, the property, all of the connections, the families remain on the occupied territories and uh, uh, those hostages uh, that were released, the families of the hostages, they do not have access to all of that. Our report um, uh, includes five chapters that describe the entire period, starting with apprehension, first uh, interrogation, and uh, their uh, hardships after release. We drafted recommendations to Ukrainian government, NGOs, Ukraine's international partner, and my colleague Katarina Busol will be speaking about those a bit later. It should be mentioned that uh, uh, people incriminated in uh, illegal detentions of people. They do not distinguish between men and women, particularly. Uh, even though we now are talking about women, but there's one thing I'm going to remember forever. One woman uh, said, the fact that I was a woman didn't matter when I was detained. I was beaten up and it didn't matter to them that I was their mother's age. Uh, these people don't have any, I don't care about age, uh, gender, etc. They're not interested in those minor details. Um, another woman said that she was uh, detained with her husband and uh, there was uh, a baby, a child, and the woman couldn't feed the child. They wouldn't uh, let her go. Even though later they let her go, uh, they didn't find evidence, but just imagine this, a young woman being detained uh, in the so-called Ministry of State Security, and outside the window, she could hear her mother with a child, with a hungry infant, and they wouldn't let the woman out, and they wouldn't let the mother with the child in to, into this um, ministry of um, so-called state security. And let me share with you more details about our report. Usually, um, people are apprehended on their way to work or at home or at work. And most of the women that we interviewed, they said that this uh, usually happens very suddenly. Um, the so-called officers of the so-called law enforcement are quite polite in the first few minutes, but this uh, only lasts until um, you are inside their vehicle well, when they take you to testify. And as soon as you're in the vehicle, then the psychological pressure and physical force and most say that um, 
they were insulted and um, uh, in the vehicle um, they uh, put a black plastic bag over their head to disorient, disorient them uh, for uh, the person not to know what they were taken to. Uh, even though most uh, of people living in um, Donetsk and Luhansk, they knew the area, they could recognize where they were taken. In most cases, that will be the so-called Ministry of State Security in Donetsk and Luhansk. And sometimes that was Isolatia plant. Stanislav Vasilyev uh, um, uh, told a lot about it. There was a place where people kept for months and tortured. Then they would uh, interrogate it with several people present, the so-called operatives. Most of them wanted to remain unknown, because that's why they're wearing balaclavas on their faces. Some would take their balaclavas off, and then the detainees could see their faces. And sometimes the women said that they knew those people, um, those faces were familiar or the, they could recognize them. And normally uh, these interrogations um, uh, were not uh, uh, just casual conversations right away. This was immense pressure. They could, uh, start beating them up right away and we heard horrible stories about uh, tying people up to the battery or chairs leaving them without water or food not taking them out to the toilet throughout the entire night and this is how the interrogations went and uh, the first night in the cell which normally would be in the basement of the so-called ministry um, uh, or Isolatia that I mentioned already. You have to understand that the people uh, who never committed um, any criminal offenses, and not just criminal offenses, but uh, misconducts either, they found themselves in the circumstances they couldn't even uh imagine these were horrible cells and horrible jailers uh, and horrible circumstances and uh, add to uh, add to that the torture that they went through the most popular reason to detain uh people that maria mentioned that uh, she said that the, there is uh, uh, 301 person and uh, 30 of them are women so the most popular reason to detain them was a suspicion of cooperation with Ukrainian special services. They qualify that as espionage. And um, in Luhansk, um, they said that suspicion of uh, treason. They also, they also treat it as... Uh as uh, threats posted in social media. We know several women who were detained because they wrote in Twitter, for example, 58-year-old woman, Olena Zavalna from Makievka. She just had her page in Twitter. She explained it, that she started writing this blog since the very beginning of the occupation because she couldn't accept the new order that uh, was uh, set on these territories. Then second people were detained because they could do some kind of photos, uh, not necessarily uh, strategically important objects, but just a picture of the street. And because of that, uh, they were arrested. They were incriminated, so-called espionage. And then later, for months, for years, sometimes those women were detained under those awful conditions that I have already explained to you. They were tortured, they were uh, treated with pressure, 
they said that uh, most probably they were threatened, uh, they were told that their children uh, would be put into orphanages, that their relatives would be killed. Uh, as a mother myself, I understand how important it is to understand that everything is okay with your child. However, they couldn't get information about uh, their children up until their release. They were told that uh, their children could have gone to the orphanage or taken by another family. Uh, they excite pressure on these women, on those women uh, who had different position that uh, most locals had. And uh, they painted a picture of what would happen. And so they paint a picture why this person could do something, uh, something that they call treason. Maria Chikova, one of the women that we interviewed, told us that when she had been taken hostage, she had been taken outside near the control point and there were a lot of people standing there. She was presented to them as, a, uh, as some, somebody who has uh, uh, made a treason. Halina Tereshenko, another woman, said that they have invited a group of so-called journalists of so-called TV channel, Russia One, this is a Russian TV channel. And for two years in a row, they filmed her. First, uh, she was filmed uh, wearing a sack on her um, head. They walked around the streets. And then second, she was taken to hospitals in handcuffs. So all the employees and patients could take a look at her to see that uh, she's a terrorist, she's awful, and a lot of people cried at her, yelled at her that she's a fascist. As I have already told you, they didn't have access to their relatives, so their family members couldn't understand what was happening to their loved ones. The meetings, uh, the dates, letters were prohibited. Those women only remember that uh, they got the opportunity to meet their uh, relatives when they were taken to the penal colony in the city of Snizhne. They didn't have access to trial. They didn't have the opportunity to choose a lawyer. There are a couple of lawyers who are so-called representatives of the Ministry of State Security, the so-called Ministry of State Security. Court, proceedings. Uh, they always happen behind closed doors. There is no access to these so-called court trials. No third party can get access. No representatives of international organization can get access to those trials. We know that UN representatives back in 2017, they could visit a so-called uh, trial. So at least they could see that this person was detained to get to know the reasons why he or she was detained. However, right now all the trials happen behind closed doors, so it's impossible to get to know what is happening there. Sometimes those trials, they happen in one day time. So this so-called court has enough time to get acquainted with all the documents, with all the materials, though they say there are several volumes of materials, and to make an indictment, a decision. After this uh, court decision, the women are sent to penal colonies, special women's women colonies that had been existed even before 2014 on the territories of Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast. All the women that we interviewed, they described these colonies as a very difficult, uh, hard and awful place where so-called political prisoners always have to be near criminals in the same prison cells. Most of those criminals were put there even before 2014. So these are people, some of them, they committed murder or some kind of other felonies management of such colonies often supports these criminals. They support this regime. That is why the detainees are always put under pressure. They are not allowed to have medicines, to take medicines, to take pills. 
uh, they can get the pills that were uh, sent by their relatives only in a several weeks time. There is no access to medical care. There is no access of international organizations to those detention facilities. So we can say that the only way to the freedom for these people, for these women, for political prisoners, this is so-called prisoner swap. We know that as of now, there is a problem with this prisoner exchange, unfortunately, with reciprocal release. As a rule, uh, mean, uh, Minsk format is now blocked. That is why there is no contact between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. The Russian Federation always tries to legalize representatives of old law to show that uh, there is uh, an internal conflict in Ukraine. So consequently, the detainees become hostages. First, they are hostages to the situation, to the circumstances. Because of this behavior of the Russian Federation, they cannot be released for years and years. We know that there are 30 women taken hostages. Among them, there are some women who have been there for more than four years. For example, Olena Fedoruk, who was detained in summer 2017. For the past few years, uh, she uh, has been in the penal colony that I have just mentioned. Our report also highlights the issue of uh, the life of former prisoners, former detainees after they have been released, how they overcome all the difficulties that they face after being released in real life. They say they, they cannot find a job all of the property is left there on the occupied territory. Very often, they don't have means to survive and to, not only to buy a flat, a new flat. Also, very few of them, very few of those women believe that uh, the guilty would be brought to justice. This is what we managed to understand when preparing this report. There were other answers to the question, what kind of punishment would you like those people to have? Most of them said that they would like to see them behind bars for the same period of time that they were promised. And some of them also said that they even thought about death penalty. The last part of our report, section number five, is dedicated to life of relatives and family members of the current prisoners and detainees that have been released in 2019, especially women. We tried to hear the story to understand what they have gone through. Anka Feldhusen has already mentioned about the difficulties, the challenges that they have to face every day. I hope, we all hope that our world, that our report will draw more attention to the issue of detainees in Donbass. This huge list containing 300 names, this long list, at least we try to have all the names on this list to understand that uh, this is not just a gray mass of people who are there behind bars, but we want to explain everyone that these are individuals, personalities with concrete names, with concrete families, that there are relatives, that they have relatives, they have family members, they have their personal life. It is very important to all of us to speak about that, to tell the names of those women who are now detained, who are taken hostage there. I would like to mention Olena Fedoruk. We also have Olena Zaitseva, who has problems with her health. 
she has so uh, huge health problems she has uh, regular bleedings uh, there is also Oksana Parshina who was detained in 2021 in May this year back then she was 10 weeks pregnant right now she's about to give birth to her child and she's also behind bars so she needs to be released I cannot keep silent about Ludmila Hussainova uh, the uh, nephew, the niece of uh, Ludmila Hussainova is present here and she will tell you more about Ludmila a little bit later. All of these stories are important. All of them are worth telling separately. Thank you so much for your attention. And if you have any question, I will be happy to answer them. Comprehensive presentation, uh, which I think answers many questions. And before we proceed with the testimony of uh, Tatiana Galant, I would like to admit uh, that we are accompanied by uh, Mr. Stanislav Tatarenko, who is a representative of the Ombudsman's Office of Ukraine. Uh, Stanislav, if you have the opportunity to speak up, we will be ready to give the floor over to you after the key speakers. After we uh, listen to all the presentation. So now, Tatiana, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for organizing this important event, for inviting me here, for providing us all the opportunity to speak up, to giving us hope that our relatives can get back to us. I would like to tell you about my godmother, about my aunt, Ludmila Hussainova. Ludmila Hussainova is a very brave woman. In 2014, she founded uh, an organization which provided help to orphans from a boarding uh, center from uh, Primorsky in Novazov region. After the occupation of Nova Azovsk by so-called DNR, there was an orphanage on the controlled territory. Now it is on the contact line. Back then, there was no access of Ukrainian forces to this orphanage. There was no opportunity to give them over some kind of help. And uh, the armed forces of the Russian Federation, they didn't care about them. That is why we civilians organized in Kiev, Odessa, Mariupol, and other uh, cities of Ukraine, a collection of uh, products, of clothes, both of toys and any other things that would be um, of help to those children. So just civilians, my friends and volunteers uh, were responsible for collecting those things. And every time when we gave it over to Ludmila, Ludmila met those uh, transportation in Mariupol, and then she drove herself to bring those things over to those children. Each time she asked to write us uh, little messages, letters to those children with uh, uh, words of support that uh, you are not forgotten, we love you, Ukraine remembers about you. Important for children is not uh, uh, just the financial support, but the love and caring of the people because they were in horrible conditions. Uh, uh, of wartime and the children were always waiting for mother Luda. This is what uh, they would call her. She, they were waiting for her to come after them, to hug them. She was an engineer at the poultry factory and she asked her director to give some meat and eggs to take to the children to make some soup, uh, to provide them with something that uh, other children had in their families on a regular basis. Many times uh, Ludmila went under shelling when she was uh, transporting uh, the assistance there because it was uh, the orphanage was close to the line of contact and she didn't hide that she believed that the town of Nova Azovsk was uh, part of Ukraine and she did not uh, hide what she was doing. She posted pictures and uh, wrote posts on Facebook. She posted uh, 
information about organizing uh, uh, New Year's celebrations, matinees for children, etc. And in October 2019, the representatives uh, of uh, the so-called uh, Ministry of Security Service uh, uh, apprehended her at work. She was accused of banditry and espionage. It took us two months to find her. We didn't know where she was. And in two months time, we learned that uh, she was in Isolatia, um, in the basement that everybody knows about. She was in horrible conditions there. She was tortured, she was abused. And after Isolatia, she was taken to a CISO pretrial detention facility number five. She's still there. She is in humane conditions. There are 30, 40 uh, people, 30, 40 women in um, a cell. She is the only civilian amongst women. Um, there are women accused of murder. There are repeated offenders there in the cell. The cell doesn't have potable water. The food that they're given is impossible to eat because it has uh, uh, soil, rocks in it. So it, it, these are inhumane conditions. And uh, the only way to survive is on what their relatives uh, um, send in. Uh, there, but as Tatiana has mentioned, not all of the medications make it there uh, because the jailers, they distribute uh, uh, these parcels themselves. And uh, it's uh, been two years with her detained there without a verdict, no trial. The case is not moving. Uh, she had uh, COVID and uh, uh, her chronic conditions worsened. She had uh, a major condition with her leg. She lost 70% of her eyesight. Uh, when she was in Isolatia, she was tortured. Her eyes were burned. And Ludmila, she's uh, a very brave woman. She hopes to be released and she hopes to continue helping children and families of uh, the detainees. And um, every time I get a chance uh, to talk to her, uh, a few times a month, every time I learn about horrible things uh, that she's going through but she hopes that she will that she will be released that she will be able to continue her work and um, uh, i am happy to receive any help and i would like uh, to say something to uh, the public to the international partners uh, i'm asking you to exert some pressure to help release these people because these brave people are fundamental for the future of our country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tatiana, for your participation, for sharing uh, this story. And thank you for staying in touch with us, sharing this, uh, sharing her story. I think this will be helpful. Uh, and uh, thank you, Katerina, for supporting us in preparing this report. Uh, I know that you're very passionate about this topic, uh, like personally and as a professional. So thank you for that. And uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, if you can also touch upon some of the recommendations that you helped us to uh, come up with, uh, I would appreciate. Um, thank you very much, Maria, and um, it really has been an honor for me to participate in this project, although, to be honest, I wish we didn't have such issues and such projects to complete and to work on. Um, but um, the initiative to show uh, the gender perspective, and I will explain why, speaking about the female victimization, we're also helping to better understand 
how the armed conflict victimizes men and how can we better help the different uh, uh, ranges of survivors, including women, men, the elderly parents and the children. And this project has indeed been the first one of, of a kind. And as Maria said, I, I've been practicing, unfortunately, um, law in Ukraine in relation to different conflict-related issues since actually 2015, but it has been the most difficult uh, project personally and professionally for me to work on. And I think it speaks volumes as to how even with the most sincere uh, intentions and actions, for instance, on prosecution of conflict-related crimes, we often omitted the core, we omitted the survivor's perspective, the survivor's voice, their experience of how um, the trauma of detention of other human rights violations has shaped them, reshaped them, and how that should impact the states uh, and then actually the international community's response to it. Um, it is quite notable uh, that um, uh, both the Ukrainian human rights community, but also Ukraine as a state, have not really prioritized the gendered approach to conflict-related justice, nor specifically have they been acting in documenting, investigating and prosecuting conflict-related sexual violence. Uh, which unfortunately, again, is inherently connected with many unlawful detention cases with respect to both women and men. So comprehend just one fact. Ukraine has, Ukraine recognized the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court in 2014. And since, since then, both the civil society and Ukraine's Prosecutor General's Office, the Prosecutor's Office of Crimea, have submitted more than a dozen of communications about a wide array of um, crimes allegedly perpetrated in occupied uh, Crimea and Donbas. But it is only now, in 2021, that the Prosecutor General's Office is working on the first communication on conflict-related sexual violence. So that's very indicative that the particular victimization of women and men has not been looked at. And the particular very, um, very particular, very difficult type of war crimes and crimes against humanity, conflict related sexual violence has not been really worked upon well in domestic criminal proceedings. Now, uh, we can of course say that it's always better to do something even if it's later, but I'm just hoping that both the civil society and the Ukrainian government become a bit more proactive in infusing the gender lens in their conflict um, uh, focused um, uh, policies. Um, as I said, um, uh, the, the, this, the study of um, the media initiative for human rights on the female uh, face of um, Donbas hostages really exemplifies how looking at female prism we understand better how in this case unlawful detention differently victimizes women and men but more importantly how we also see a very deep secondary trauma experienced by relatives especially by children and um, why it is so important again to look at this female prism because I've been working with um, uh, survivors, both male and female survivors from Donbass, and men don't speak about many experiences. They don't speak about their own psychological um, trauma from the detention very often. They also don't necessarily um, speak about the impact of their detention on their family. And it's actually women who say that uh, it's not only them who need psychological support, which is crucially lacking from the state. They're saying that, that the uh, whole um, package of help from the government uh, should include psychological support, not just of the survivors, but of the wider family and especially of children. Um, more importantly, uh, further on, uh, it was the female detainee uh, who participated in this um, study who also said how important it was for her to get a couple counseling uh, support 
again, something that Ukraine is not doing yet and something that it should consider in its policy of reparation and its policy of helping the survivors uh, of, of um, uh, atrocity crimes from Donbas and Crimea. Um, now, going to uh, the domain of uh, criminal proceedings, as I mentioned, unfortunately, um, quite late, Ukraine has started looking more into the sexualized aspects of um, unlawful detention. Uh, but I must say that as sexual violence uh, is stigmatized and underreported as an ordinary crime in peacetime, the case is even worse with conflict-related sexual violence. First, um, the survivors often narrowly associate this notion only with rape. So they don't necessarily report the cases, for instance, when they have been threatened with rape or when they were made uh, observe rape and, of course, experience the strong anxiety that the same conduct might be perpetrated with respect to them now or sometime later. Uh, uh, female detainees also don't necessarily understand that um, forced nudity or forced keeping of male and female detainees together is also not just a violation of international law, but a particular type of a violation, a particular type of conflict-related sexual violence. And unfortunately, it's not a problem only of survivors. It's also a problem of um, criminal um, justice professionals, investigators, and prosecutors who also not only associate conflict-related sexual violence with rape, but they also are um, uh, very uh, narrow and rigid in their approach to evidence, to proving this rape. And of course, we can understand that any, not just detention um, related crimes, but crimes which are perpetrated in occupied and temp uh, territories and territories temporarily not under the control of the Ukrainian government are very hard to investigate and prosecute because of the lack of the access to the territory the lack of access to the perpetrators and the lack of access, not just to evidence, but to the immediate access to evidence. And um, unfortunately, in uh, again, um, conflict related sexual violence cases, um, investigators and prosecutors often demand forensic evidence or physical evidence, uh, basically the proof on, of injuries on, on, on a survivor's body that violence had been perpetrated um, against her. And this is impossible to produce when um, violence, torture, sexual violence was um, committed against um, the, the, the lady or gentleman who was in, who were in detention months ago. Um, and that is why it's truly necessary for um, domestic Ukrainian domestic investigators and prosecutors to widen their approach to evidence for conflict related uh, crimes to look at the jurisprudence uh, of international courts and see that victim statements and witness statements are principal source of evidence in such cases. Otherwise, it will be just impossible to prove what they're trying to prove if they want to have forensic evidence. I'm sorry about being very de detailed about these particularities, but you won't believe how many survivors just turn away from reporting these crimes because they're being asked to produce what they physically cannot produce and that just dashes their hope for justice. Um, moving further, I would also want to point out on Ukraine's developing transitional justice strategy, which includes both judicial and non-judicial means of addressing the conflict-related grievances, and that includes prosecutions, that includes truth uh, initiatives, that includes uh, reparations and institutional reforms. And um, while I've already touched upon um, investigations, prosecutions and institutional reform, the change of this culture of investigators and prosecutors, how they approach detention related violence and have strong gender lenses, I wanted to focus more on reparations because both, as I'm sure the Ukrainian and international audience here know, Ukraine does not have yet a comprehensive reparation system for survivors of grave human rights violations or for a particular group of survivors, for instance, for people who have been through detention 
or for females or males who have uh, suffered from conflict-related sexual violence. And um, through the interviews uh, that you will be able to read through the quotes that you will be able to read in, in the report that we are discussing now, you will see that uh, the, the first uh, major request of survivors is to have the sustainable medical and psychological assistance. So even after those um, un uh, unlawful detainees and prisoners of war exchanges, which Maria has mentioned, and which hopefully will happen soon, uh, such medical and psychological support was provided but it was very meager and there was no sustainable support for survivor, let alone there was no couple counseling or psychological support for the wider family members and especially children. And I mentioned that this is a particular request of female uh, detainees from Donbass. Uh, second, with respect to reparations, but also with respect to the wider um, transitional justice policy. And we know that recently, uh, the government has registered with the parliament the draft law on the um, uh, a, a policy for transitional period. Um, there should be more consultations with survivors. There should be a more victim-centered approach to all deoccupation and reconciliation policies, because it should be them, the, the people who have suffered the most, who inform the policy and say what they want to see what kind of benefits they would want to see, what kind of a truth initiative they would like to see. And as of now, unfortunately, the government has not engaged that much with survivors. The government has engaged quite considerably with the civil society, but the civil society is still more of an intermediary. They should engage more with survivor groups. Uh, also, it's crucial for the president to finally sign the law 2689, which was adopted by the parliament in late May this year. And this draft law brings Ukraine's criminal code in compliance with international humanitarian and criminal law and gives a, a very qualitative toolkit to domestic investigators, prosecutors and judges to qualitatively conduct conflict related cases. For instance, this draft law has a full uh, and a much wider range of uh, war crimes that are currently there in um, Ukraine's criminal code. Second, the draft law introduces the notion of crimes against humanity. And this notion is very important um, for, for Crimea, for the persecution of Crimean Tatars. Um, finally, I already mentioned conflict-related sexual violence. This draft law introduces a whole range of acts which can constitute conflict-related sexual violence. And as I said, unfortunately, both survivors and sometimes even um, criminal law professionals understand sexual violence as something related only to rape, but they would not understand that a forced pregnancy or forced nudity um, or keeping male and male detainees uh, together could qualify as uh, sexual violence. Therefore, this amendment to the criminal code is much needed and there is great hope from the human rights community that the president will finally sign it. Um, uh, special investigative and prosecutorial strategies for um, different types of um, conflict-related crimes, such as torture or sexual violence, are clearly needed because, as I provided an example with um, evidence, um, it's natural that domestic criminal um, justice professionals simply lack the experience of dealing with the crimes of such magnitude and of such a different context. Um, also, uh, the staff of Ukraine's investigative and prosecutorial bodies should be more gender diverse. It means that a survivor would really sh should really have a chance to choose whether she or he would want to communicate with a female or a male investigator who she trusts more. And I can share that um, um, it, 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 actually many colleagues from um, many colleagues prosecutors tell me that even male survivors feel more comfortable speaking to female investigators and prosecutors about their uh, detention related experience, especially about such a sensitive issue as sexual violence. So this proves the thesis that I started with, that uh, uh, when we look closer at the female perspective, we 
really um, enhance the gender, gender sensitivity of all um, uh, justice and reconciliation um, initiatives, and that benefits both women and men. Um, obviously, also the um, expert development and the capacity building for investigators, prosecutors, and judges is needed crucially domestically because they haven't dealt with this type of crimes. And uh, the recent novelty, I would say, that I got uh, from survivors is that they're oftentimes also traumatized by psychologists who might be you know, good psychologists for the ordinary practice, but who are not necessarily trained to work with survivors, again, of atrocity crimes. So any capacity building that Ukraine or Ukraine's foreign partners can ensure both for criminal justice professionals, but also for psychologists would be very relevant. Um, last but not least, two uh, quasi-international in, um, recommendations. Uh, first, Ukraine should finally ratify the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court and fully cooperate with the court in submitting more evidence on different conflict-related crimes um, and including a conflict-related sexual violence. And second, um, a couple of days ago, well, uh, on the 25th of November, uh, the EU Parliament has adopted an, a resolution on sanctioning the Wagner group of mercenaries who, as it's widely known, uh, are quite connected with um, the crimes in you know, Central African Republic, Venezuela, and of course, uh, Ukraine. And um, in that um, uh, resolution, the European Parliament calls upon the international community and its own member state to um, support uh, domestic um, uh, uh, criminal proceedings with respect to any crimes perpetrated by the, uh, the, 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 the uh, persons like the members of the Wagner group. And so that was a direct reference to the universal jurisdiction proceedings, which uh, mean that if um, a, an, a crime uh, was perpetrated elsewhere in the world, but it's so atrocious, if it's like a war crime or crime against humanity, then another country kind of not connected with, 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 the, with the place where the deed was perpetrated or with the um, victim or with the perpetrator itself, uh, other states still can and should investigate and prosecute those deeds exactly because what danger they pose to the international rule-based order and survivors um, trust in justice. And as our event today is organized and if the whole project has been generously supported by the government of Germany, I just wanted to draw our attention to the groundbreaking ruling that Germany, a German court uh, passed a week ago uh, when, a, um, uh, when the crime of genocide against the members of the Yazidi community was established through the proceedings based on the universal jurisdiction principle. So um, it is my final recommendation and a final call that more attention um, of um, foreign investigative and prosecutorial bodies be also paid to atrocities perpetrated in occupied Crimea and Donbass, including those which victimize women. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Katarina. I'm really proud that you agreed to participate in this project and it was really great that we managed to get you on board, so to say, and thank you for your work. Um, and now we would like to ask whether Stanislav would like to tell us a couple of words. Stanislav? Stanislav Tatarenko, are you here with us? Would you like to have the floor? Stanislav, we cannot hear you, unfortunately. You seems to be on mute. You are unmuted, but we cannot hear you, unfortunately. Unfortunately, we cannot hear you. Probably you will try to reconnect once again. And then probably we will hear you because unfortunately right now there's no connection. Maybe uh, some of uh, our guests have some questions uh, while you're thinking on, on the possible 
questions, I would like to admit that uh, um, you can read the report uh, in Ukrainian, in uh, English, in Russian, and in German language on our website. Uh, I provided the link uh, in the chat, and of course, uh, it has already been published on our Facebook page, so you can find it there, and you can go direct, di directly to mipl.org.ua, and you can see there the <coughs> report. Pane Stanislav, is the yet zaraz was chutno. Stanislav, we can hear you right now. It seems to me. Stanislav, can you hear us? Yes, finally, I can hear you. So if you have any comments, we would be happy to hear them. Yes, of course. First, I would like to sincerely thank for inviting me here to express my sincere gratitude to all people who took part in organizing this event. I was present when you had the presentation of this report offline. It was very exciting to listen to. Well, if I can tell this exciting to hear to those people who were victims to torture, who were detained unlawfully on the temporarily occupied territories of Donbass, unfortunately, those who were released. And I hope that uh, they will be able to come back to normal life. I would like to thank you for the report that you prepared. It was a hard work. A lot has been done. A lot of people were interviewed. A lot of information was collected based on this work. And now I would like to tell you a couple of works. Uh, the Government Commission on Human Rights, unfortunately, doesn't have the opportunity to to visit citizens of Ukraine who are unlawfully detained or the temporarily occupied territories in detention facilities who were brought to criminal responsibility unlawfully, who were put behind bars by so-called courts, who were unlawfully imprisoned and who are still unfortunately detained in detention facilities. Of course, we are grateful for any information that we might get from our compatriots, from their relatives, for any information in the media based on requests like yours. We are really grateful for all the information we might get to listen to those people who have suffered. We do get such uh, messages, such information. We process a lot of information from different sources. We see that uh, there are a lot of violations of the rights uh, to freedom, rights uh, to free speech, rights to life, right to proper detention, uh, detention conditions, to providing medical help getting access to healthcare services and many other rules which are unfortunately are violated by the so-called occupation powers, by the so-called DNR and LNR. The occupational government on these territories, they uh, deprive us citizens of that. Unfortunately, we cannot help them personally uh, we cannot go there uh, check the conditions that they are kept in but we're doing our best the uh, ombuds per person uh, uh, is in touch with international organizations uh, red cross security service of ukraine etc uh, etc et everyone uh, who can impact the situation, help our citizens there to uh, open the case, investigate uh, the circumstances of their illegal detention, the tortures that they went through. Um, we asked the International Committee of Red Cross to uh, 
organize a visit there to provide the detainees with uh, some medical attention. Thank you once again for this opportunity to join uh, you in the discussion of this report, which I find very important. I am convinced that this endeavor should continue. And of course, we understand that uh, uh, time goes by, but uh, we need to collect as much information about the human rights violations against our citizens. And I'm convinced uh, that uh, we will manage to make sure justice is served and those that are guilty will be punished. And we're now talking about women, but men are also illegally detained. And uh, I believe that they, become, that they will become witnesses in the cases that our law enforcement will have, international courts will have, and I believe that all the guilty will be prosecuted. Thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to our cooperation in the future. Thank you, uh, Mr. Stanislav from Human Rights Watch uh, raised her hand. I'm not sure whether she's still ready and wants to uh, participate in our discussion. Uh, Julia, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you so much. Um, I was just uh, about to uh, jump off the call because I, I have to rush uh, off, but thank you for uh, giving me the floor. I just wanted to make a very quick um, comment. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for this extremely interesting, extremely useful presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have my video on. Um, I just don't have a technical uh, capability right now. Um, so the aspect that I wanted to very briefly mentioned, which already was mentioned uh, today, but I just wanted to expand them a little. Um, under international human rights and humanitarian law, um, in custody, detainees have a right to be treated with humanity and respect for their dignity, and that includes access to appropriate medical care. And uh, Human Rights Watch uh, did a report on ill treatment of uh, female detainees, specifically in Donbass, uh, which was published in July of 2021. And in that report, we found that uh, the so called DNR and LNR um, failed uh, to provide um, access to adequate medical care to all detainees and specifically to women. Uh, and there are a number of uh, international rules and regulations, including the um, uh, so-called Bangkok rules, uh, both the United Nations rules for the treatment of women prisoners. Um, and they address the specific and distinctive need of women in custody uh, in providing gender specific healthcare and specific accommodations for women, including pregnant and breastfeeding women. Um, and, you know, I wanted also to provide a quick update on Aksana Parshina, who was in fact released under house arrest, as far as I know, uh, and she is no longer in detention. But um, uh, what I wanted to point out, um, and I think all of you um, are aware of that as well, is that she, uh, while she was in a uh, temporary detention facility, she contracted COVID, uh, which endangered her pregnancy, uh, and she was quite um, in advance during this pregnancy. And, you know, that, of course, is completely unacceptable. And uh, I agree with Tatiana, uh, who uh, reiterated the same point. Um, and so we, um, in our report, we called uh, specifically, we, join all the recommendations that were uh, voiced here today, but specifically urgent access to adequate medical care for all women detainees is absolutely uh, crucial. Thank you. 
thank you so much, uh, Julia, for joining us today and for our great cooperation and for your support to, uh, to all these issues and for preparing the reports. Thank you so much. And maybe just to uh, wrap up, uh, I would like to uh, mention that uh, just uh, today, um, uh, we all probably who is interested or somehow engaged in all these topics have received uh, the uh, announcement from the um, uh, Human Rights United Nations Human Rights Monitoring Mission in Ukraine that uh, they have prepared uh, the next uh, thematic report. Um, and uh, in particular, they mentioned that in territory controlled by, uh, I quote, in territory controlled by self proclaimed republics, uh, in at least four cases, uh, UN human rights found that social media users uh, faced uh, arbitrary detention and criminal penalties for expressing views online. And this is just very much um, uh, kind of um, sound familiar to us because this is the trend that we have noticed recently uh, while researching this uh, topic. And uh, uh, yesterday, my colleague Tatiana actually published next story on our Facebook page describing the story of one of the uh, social media users that was subjected to persecution precisely for her activities uh, in, in social media. And this is a uh, woman. I would like uh, to ask Tatiana, say a few words uh, about this uh, story and uh, wrap up the discussion and maybe say a few final words uh, to every uh, everyone. Thank you, Maria. The story that you just mentioned is the story of Olena Zavalna, who made posts on Twitter. She used a pseudonym and she was Бачки. <laughs> This is a woman who was detained because Marina didn't want to move out. She didn't agree with the regime and she didn't she did want to continue. She wrote in social media and right now she's in Panel Connolly in colony in Snizhne, and she has got 10 years imprisonment together with her aunt, uh, Tatiana's aunt, with Ludmila Hosseinova. Uh, she's under the same conditions. Thank you. And now let me close our meeting, our presentation. I would like to thank again to the um, Embassy of Germany in Ukraine and uh, personally to uh, Ambassador Feldhusen for participating in our presentation and for supporting this whole project. And would really hope that we can cooperate and further on circulating this report as wide as it's possible because we have this report in four languages, as I've mentioned, and it's really essential that um, as many as possible people get access to this information. And we, of course, hope that that uh, Christmas will bring us some wonderful news about the release of people, uh, about some swaps uh, or simultaneous exchange, uh, as I should have said it. Um, and uh, let's just hope for that and let's work for that. Uh, thank all of you all for participating and for attending our presentation. And should you have any further questions, you can write uh, to me, to Tatiana, or to, uh, to the Facebook page of Media Initiative for Human Rights. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll see you very soon. We'll meet you very soon in person or online within the next uh, events. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.